Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome yeah. to another episode of the uh, River Basin Policy Planning and Operations Interview Series. Uh, my name is Ethan Yang. I am a assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Lehigh University. And today we have the honor to have Professor Ximing Kai with us. Professor Kai is recently named the Ben Chi Yen Professorship at the University of Illinois. And he was actually my advisor when I was there until 2010. So welcome, Professor Kai. And can you give us a quick introduction about yourself and maybe say hello to our audience? Uh, first of all, thanks, Ethan, for doing this very interesting interview with me on river basin management and planning. I also thanks for anyone who might watch this video. Our very first question is, uh, so what do you do professionally and then how do you uh, characterize your main involvement with the modeling uh, water systems? Sure. Yeah. You, you know that I, I started working on river basin management for my, with my PhD thesis. I did that uh, integrated hydroeconomic modeling. And uh, then I got a job at uh, International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRE and uh, continued uh, some work on river basin management, especially the Maple River Basin in Chile. So that's a project sponsored by World Bank. They try to provide some research support for water market in Chile. At IFPRE, uh, another work of mine is to add uh, water as a component to impact. It's an international model for food demand, production, and, and trade. I basically, I use a, a basin approach for the very simplified water component. Fortunately, it works. Uh, and uh, since then, we have the so-called impact. And then I joined the UFI with some questions. All right. So the, the, the first question is, how could we add more hydrology uh, into basin management models, especially the, the modern work I did before? Uh, how could we incorporate hydrologic forecasts Right. And the other one, you, you know that, how could we set up a more realistic institutional framework for basin modeling? So, so the work I did at, with, with, with Maple is theoretical model, assuming like a super hand for the, for the basin authority. But in the real world, we know the decision makers are, are heterogeneous. So we cannot assume our water users will for, form the uniform regulations or, or policies. So, so anyway, with these two questions, I started some new work at uh, UFI. So I, you know that I, I worked on the quantification of human interference on hydrology, uh, on, on hydrological processes. And also your thesis actually studied with this agent-based modeling for rural based management. I know you, you did some theoretical work and also applied that to the, to the Yellow River Basin. And there were, there were a lot of follow-up on that. Yeah, 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 that's great, that's great. And then just give our audience some time frame. So you joined IFPRI in 1999? Uh, 1999, yeah, yeah okay. after I finished my thesis. And then you joined right. UI 2003? At the end of 2003. From your experiences and from the lesson that you learned throughout all these projects for the past 20 something years, um, in your opinion, what is the most successful real world modeling related project that you have been involved with? And what is your role in that project? And why do you think, what component make that project uh, successful? Okay, that's a very good question. <laughs> I'm involved in very successful model applications. I would say my role is more on the astrology development mm -hmm. and uh, colleagues uh, often joke at, with, at me. They said, I only care about the methodology. I even did not read the <laughs> result <laughs> section and the discuss <laughs> section. I don't care about those. I only care about <laughs> methodology. <laughs> okay. So, but uh, the, you know, the, the maple model we developed, uh, we call that as a, one of the hydroeconomic modeling along with JNN's work. Uh, that has been applied to many other river basins around the world. I hope, I hope the uh, people following that methodology, people made some impact to local level uh, in different countries. Another uh, um, kind of major uh, application-oriented basin man managing work is with Lyle Basin. 
uh -huh. uh, so in 2007, uh, I, actually you were here uh, around that time. Uh, I was hired by the World Bank as a consultant to develop a term of references for a lyobasin lyo basin management model. The idea is to develop a kind of regional economy mm -hmm. uh, to facilitate yeah. water trade. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and, and the, it, it follows the idea of the so-called water water flow. Uh -huh. Right. So in that frame, in that region, people could trade food. In that way, the water could be effectively used in 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 different places. Yeah. So so the 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 looks like they like the the uh, the hydro economic modeling framework. So I in that project I I, I work in, I, I worked with real stakeholders. Mm -hmm. uh, they got people from nine countries or ten regions in the Lyle Basin, mm -hmm. and uh, we worked through several workshops. Uh, I understood what they want, and I try to make the 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 the, the methodology more following their their requirement yeah. i was involved in that in that project for several uh let me put it this way so i, I finished the terms of references and then they held a international consult consultant yeah. to develop the model and i worked as a, a project advisor I'm, i also want to mention the agent based model i, I know back to some years ago we even had some debate about if we should anyway, <laughs> care about aging based model because it's so difficult to simulate people's yeah. behavior. Yeah. Now you know that, right? Now we yeah. don't we don't debate. Yeah, we, yeah. Do yeah. Uh, yeah, we don't need to justify that anymore. Just, <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. because of the data availability, because yeah. of uh, some supporting methodology, we could do it better, right? Yeah. Especially I, I was, uh, I have an NSF project to study the water permit in the water permit allocation in the Republican railroad basin in Nebraska. So in, in that project, actually, we developed an agent-based model to study how heterogeneous farmers' behaviors yeah. might affect the policy, might affect the hydrology in the, in the region. Uh, especially the flow depletion to the downstream cancers. I have a kind of methodology uh, oriented path, uh, but I hope some of these methods are used by people and they generate some, some real impacts. Uh, recently, I, I tell my students, I said, now we should switch our emphasis. We should not just focus on the model development. <laughs> we should think about anyway how the model could be, be really used. Because I just realized, actually, we, we did not really publish a lot on the model application, but others, uh, I noticed some people, they use our modeling method. They, they yeah. publish very influential papers. That's, yeah. that's a yeah. good thing. Yeah. Anyway. I think that's, that's, that's a balance where you want to focus on the theoretical development and also the application in the real world. And I think that balance is a little bit tricky, but if you can make it well, then uh, it should be very, it should have a deeper impact. Follow on my question. So on the other side, have you ever involved in any unsuccessful uh, modeling effort or any real world project <laughs> that's that is yeah. I won't call it fail but maybe does not achieve <laughs> the goal that was originally being designed and why do you think that might happen? I'm more confident to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. let, let me go back to the Lyle Basin. Yeah, uh, yeah. my Lyle Basin experience. Yeah, yeah. As I just said, I was held yeah. as um project advisor. So my responsibility is to do work assessment, mm -hmm. uh, progress assessment, uh, work plan confirmation. After about one year, I quit the job. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there are different reasons. I, I probably, I'm, I'm, I was too busy. I started to have a large, but to be honest, so if I know a little bit more about the bureaucratic in uh, the real world, yeah. if yeah. I have better interperson <laughs> <laughs> uh, communication skills yeah. with like practicing for practitioners yeah, yeah. in general with stakeholders. Yeah, yeah. I might be able to continue my role over there and, and finish my the term as as advisor. Yeah. And then the tour might be much more successful. Yeah. Uh, so because what I really expect is that I don't expect the tour will will generate like 
real policies yeah, or yeah. support real decisions yeah. at the current stage. But yeah. I hope with it, the talk could be a kind of a learning talk for, yeah, pe for people yeah. from different countries. Yeah. So let's try something, try something different. Yeah. If I trade my water to another region, I use less water, but I actually could get more benefit, yeah, more yeah, profit, yeah. right? Yeah. So I hope people could use that tool to learn to learn things, to yeah. explore options. But unfortunately, I, I'm not sure that was really true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this this is my regret. This is mm. my regret. Maybe I could say I'm a kind of person which emphasizes too much on academic work rather than real world work. But I, if I put a little more emphasis, if I I try to overcome some difficulties there, yeah. anyway, things might be different. So yeah. that's kind of regret. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in that Lion River project, that's I saw the usually because usually if that's a World Bank supported project, the the bank staff usually will also help with the facilitating the connection between the uh, academic person and and the stakeholder. So what is their role in that in that? In that's that that's a very, very good question. Yeah. I know you are familiar with with the, the setting. I was originally contacted by the World Bank. They yeah. said my role over there is I'm a consultant. But the World Bank, the, the money, my yeah. boss is not yeah. from the World Bank. Yeah. It's from Nile Basin Initiatives. It's a local people. Uh, anyway, I'm probably like academic person from the United States, understand too much about the real world the difficulties yeah. uh, to, yeah. to conduct some research, uh, to make something implemented for to support real world situation. I, I don't understand much about <laughs> politics. <laughs> so, I, yeah. yeah, I try to get help from the World Bank from time to time. And I believe they support me, but uh, yeah. anyway, yeah, they, they, I, mean, I, I believe they also understand what I did. <laughs> yeah, 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 usually they're, they're also in a difficult position because they, they cannot really directly get involved in a inside the country political issue. So they, yeah, there's not much they can really push, but yeah. Yeah, but in general, I would say that was a kind of very good experience with me. I organized and hosted two or three workshops because I waited then three times in the mm. summer. I got people, got both technicians and the managers from different countries. I yeah. taught them the very basic elements about crop modeling, mm. about benefit and the costs mm -hmm. about water allocation. And they, they showed very big interest. I, I was very encouraged by their performance. Yeah. So I believe the, the stakeholders at the end, they kind of bought the idea of the so-called a market-based approach yeah. Uh, yeah. to help resolve the water conflicts in the Lyle mm -hmm. Basin. How do you think the interaction between a software or a method developer like yourself or your student or your group versus the people who are actually going to use that model for the model uh, application. And then, um, you know, how, what what is the importance about that interactions in this, this, this kind of project that you, you've been involved with? That, that's obviously, uh, yeah. I mean, software development is helpful and even necessary for yeah. model application. But I want to probably, I want to share with people from a yeah. different angle. Some I mean, we are dreaming someday we could have a fully automatic tool <laughs> to support the decisions. We could go to sleep and uh, this automat fully automatic system can do things for us. And also we tried so hard to build beautiful models, yeah. optimization, very complex optimization models. And we kind of assume people were using it. Uh, uh, people yeah. are using that. Yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. true. Yeah. That's not true. Yeah. And I also don't think the error, although we have very big advancement in information technology, yeah. I don't think this fully automatic software support yeah. will be realistic yeah. in, yeah. in the future. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. in the future. At least in the near future, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I really want to emphasize for software development, mm. how could we really bring mm. the users Mm. into the processes, mm. into the decision processes. We know it's so difficult to simulate decision makers' brain, or yeah. like it's so difficult to do brain like a mental model, right? Although yeah. we, we have machine learning, we have all this yeah. artificial intelligence, yeah. but it's still limited to yeah. really to have a realistic simulation of what they are doing, what they are yeah. thinking. Yeah. But with the information, with the internet, with, with the, the software technology today, we could bring them 
into the decision processes. So I can give you an example. So, so recently, we are, my group is working with a USDA research project. We are developing real-time irrigation scheduling for farmers. Mm. You know that there, there are numerous models, uh, yeah. online models including <laughs> They support farmers' real-time irrigation. Yeah. And uh, you can just run the model and then use the results. Yeah. But farmers don't, don't, don't believe that. Yeah. Farmers don't want to tell anywhere. I have done irrigation scheduling over many years myself. Yeah. Yeah. Should I follow you? So we really, our purpose is that we want to design a tool which would directly involve farmers into the process. So then we adopt a kind of human-machine interaction approach our model based on hydrologic forecast, based on soil moisture simulation, based on field data uh, through a data simulation approach, we could generate we could generate suggestions on irrigation in a particular day, and then we interact directly each day. We interact with the with the farmer. Do you like the recommendation? Mm -hmm. If you like it, you take it. If yeah. you don't like it then tell us how you're going to irrigate. So for example, we recommend 0.5 inches on that particular day based on the forecast, based on what happened in the past. The farmer said, oh, okay, I, I probably, I, I might just put 0.3 inches. Fine, but tell us, because that's important. Then that will be assimilated back into yep. our model yep. to generate more realistic yep. recommendations for next irrigation day. Uh, so, so we are some. Our dream is to develop a, a kind of iPhone app, and that iPhone app could be installed in farmers' farmers' cell phone, yep. and they can check day by day, and they found some recommendation from us and they give yep. us some feedback. Maybe after some days, they could go back to check again. And um, that's it. That that's the kind of idea. And we've also tried to do this with real world reservoir operation. So mm -hmm. you know, especially in in flooding control period. Uh, mm -hmm. The real world operation for reservoir is is important, right? Yeah. So how could we get the operators involved in our modeling processes? Great, I think, yeah, that's that's also sort of answered uh, our next question because I think what what you just say is that those interaction between either software developer or uh, academia persons versus the real users getting the feedback from the real world user is actually gonna make the outcome of that project or the or the tool that we develop make make it more useful and make it more realistic in a decision-making process in the real world. That also provides some implications for software development yep. we, we just talked yeah. about. But yeah. for modelers, I'm just thinking about, on one hand, we should incorporate science, yeah. right? We should incorporate solid yeah. scientific support. Yeah. Now we have data from the field, from sensors, yeah. data from remote sensing. We should use this, right? Yeah. We should, we have more advanced simulation model. We should use this. That's one. On, on the other hand, how could we make farmers really trust you uh -huh. and use your model? Not, not uh -huh. just to show your model is useful, right? Yeah. We yeah. should do our best to make our model to be used. Uh, uh -huh. Actually, we did some workshops uh -huh. with uh, farmers. And, and, you know, in the beginning, as you do, they don't believe what we did. Yeah. Right? They have doubts. They, yeah. they are not that excited. Yeah. But after one term of experiments, uh -huh. they started to become excited. They started to, to tell us, hey, you should add this, you should add that. <laughs> hey, have you considered about fertility irrigation? In the beginning of the irrigation season, I want yeah. to apply water with fertilizer. Have you yeah. considered about that? Mm -hmm. So the other things that usually I irrigate in a particular day, then I need to wait for a couple of days. Yeah. Things like that. So we yeah. learned a lot from them. Yeah, yeah we learned a lot. So that also shows if we really... If I have a good interface to involve them, they, they will trust you. Uh, and, and, and hopefully they will, anyway, yeah. eventually they will use it. You said this is a USDA support project. Where's the study area? So I'm involved in, currently I'm involved in two USDA projects. Uh -huh. One is led by University of Iowa. That is called Smart Irrigation System Development. Uh -huh. uh, the PI is, uh, is uh, uh, atmospheric scientist. His group makes forecasts. 
Uh, the other one is a uh, sustainable agriculture system led by University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, the Xin Dongliang is a PI. Uh -huh. So we are working with them also mm -hmm. to use their forecast. So we basically we target the we target the, uh, the whole country. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have done now we, we are doing experiments. We have already mm -hmm. done some experiments with Labrasca. Okay. And, you know, that's a major irrigation. Our next question is going to be, I would say, more general or the scale is larger. So based on your these previous uh, involvements or your contribution for different projects, uh, for different like model supported decision making projects, can you give us like a sort of like a summary about like what type of things will work or what type of thing will not work? All right, that, that, that's some very initial thoughts, and uh, <laughs> I hope I will not bring any bias into my my statements. <laughs> so anyway, I I think over years we have made a lot of progress. Computational support to incorporate physical processes to incorporate all kinds of complexity in decision making. So people work on algorithms, yeah. uh, people work on more and more complex models. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we, we have a lot of publications. There, there, there are some progress over there. And the other one is, I, I believe now people, more people believe that the use of data and the data techniques. Let me give you an example. So for example, for reservoir operation, so, so it's so difficult to you know to work on reservoir operation because yeah. we don't know the operator's behavior, right? Yeah. We could yeah. not accurately accurately represent their yeah. behavior. How yeah. do they represent? How do they respond to a flooding? How do they respond to a drought? Yeah. We don't know exactly. It's so difficult to 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 do it. Yeah. But now in the U.S., for most of the major reservoirs, we have over 20 years or even long, longer data record. Reservoir inflow, storage, release. The data might tell us what might happen. The data might tell us what has already happened. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you remember Mohammed Hajas worked yeah. on his PhD thesis yeah, to yeah. use machine learning to dig yeah. out what variables we might miss in yeah. our traditional reservoir operation model. So, so now today, I, I believe using more advanced machine learning techniques, yeah. we might be able, be able to dig out some rules which are affected by both the physical, uh, like hydrologic variability, as well as decision makers' behaviors. We may not know that explicitly, yeah. but they're embedded. Right, they are already embedded over there. So in that sense, I, I believe the data techniques will continue to to help us, especially to dig out those hidden states and mm -hmm. hidden variables. And, and then based on that, the model could be realistic uh, by incorporating what we found from the data. So so by the way, recently we our group published a data set. So actually we, we use long-term records uh, we derived the operation rows, the if then rows, explicit rows mm -hmm. for four hundred for over four hundred fifty reservoirs. Uh, we share the data in hydro shell. People can download the input data and download the decision, the behavior, the the if then operation rows, mm -hmm. and uh, we hope people can incorporate that into. Uh, watershed hydrologic models. Uh, and then, of course, also, I, I noticed you have done a lot of work on that. Is a, so taking advantage of the internet, right? So we could make a lot of things online and, and th that that provides either an interface with people. Yeah. Right? And so that might also be a, like a way to do, to incorporate many, the many stakeholders yeah. into our modeling processes right, remotely. So I, I, also, I, I believe this could, uh, there are already a lot of progress and I believe this uh, is kind of a direction. But on the other hand, you, you also asked about what are not well done, right? <laughs> I, I still, in terms of real basic modeling, I still want to emphasize, first of all, what is the institutional setting mm. for the basin? It's like, like the central authorized like what we have in china or is more like road i mean bottom up yeah. based on the road level yeah. uh, that's more like i mean the, the many river basins in the yeah. united states yeah. they have some road level associations mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so there's some voice yeah. Some voice come up from the road level associations. They go up to yeah. <laughs> anyway to uh, some 
state or federal agencies oh, yeah, yeah. For, for for decision making. And and we know Australia, they are they are trying they actually they are quite successful yeah. in oh, adopting yeah. the, the kind of middle approach, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the company of top down and bottom up approach yeah. to develop more realistic model and more realistic policies for basin management. And in the in the institutional setting, right, we also Again, we have to put a lot of effort on how could we represent heterogeneity, right? So I know you 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 are working on that, and yeah, uh, yeah. my group uh, there are still only not many. There are a few students there still working in that direction. So actually, I sometimes I'm telling my my students that, like the work in my group is kind of unified or it's kind it's kind of coordinated by the coupled human nature systems. I mean, the dream is that hopefully we in some years later we we might have a, a model which is based on distributed hydrology, but also based on distributed institution. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, and, and their interaction. And then we will not have any debate on this is a hydrology model, and this is a water <laughs> management model, and we should have one model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the other things I want to emphasize is uh, how much focus we used for mm-hmm. river basin mm-hmm. modeling and operation. How could we make more use? So, you know, like LOA and many other national water surveys, I mean, they are hosting some operational models. And recently, I just realized that they said their reservoir, reservoir mo- uh, operation modules have not been updated over decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they really, they really want the forecast informed reservoir operation. So that's a big issue, right? So it, it's not like, hey, we, we have a good forecast and then people can use that. It, it's not, uh, I mean, actually, Majid published a paper on the farmer's trust on yeah. drought for the cost depends not only on the, the scaling scores, but on many other things. So I, I think that's it. That's what we, we, we need to do more. Mm-hmm. How could we make our basin planning and operation more forecast informed? And another thing, I, I still, anyway, I have been talking about this over 30 years, starting from my, my thesis. So if you remember, for the RSA basin in Central Asia, we have increasing irrigated area. And then we have, before 1960s, we have some stable fluctuated yeah. inflow to the lake. And then around, maybe around 1970s, there was a sharp decline. Yeah. Like we call that as a tipping point, yeah. okay, as a tipping yeah. point. And then it never went back. It's not mm-hmm. like a regular fluctuation. It never went back. I'm still, I mean, over how many, over all these years, I'm still, in, I'm still thinking about how to explain that. Okay, how to provide scientifically based support yeah. for that tipping point, because yeah. that's so important for policy development, right? For the real world basin development. So in, you know, now in recent years, we, we learned something from complex systems. They say, oh, there's, how could we predict the tipping point? <laughs> things are still, since the steer stay with it's very simple, yeah. we're at a conceptual level, but how could we learn more on that and explain is then the long-term cumulative impacts of mm. human activities in our basin. In mm. order to have an early alert or forecast mm. about like kind of big thing which yeah. might happen in the future. Yeah. That's a that's a uh I, I know, uh, for engineers, for scientists, that we if we could do that, then we will make good contribution to human. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, the the the, the three more concepts is definitely very popular recently like once we already observe a tipping point that's already too late because that's already happened. <laughs> exactly, right? exactly so, so you, right. you need some sort of like early yeah. warning system to tell you that it might come it might come so you, you need to be exactly. careful because after that yeah. it's, it's just really, yeah yeah okay. yeah, yeah. The, the example for for the hour say is that the tipping point is not reserved you, you cannot reverse it it's irreversible we, yeah, we put yeah, it in yeah. that word there are also some good, relatively positive story in the Republican River Basin. Yeah. You know that in starting from 1980s up to 1990s, the river to downstream Kansas was almost cut off, especially mm-hmm. in the dry right season. And then, and then there were some negotiations between Nebraska and Kansas yeah. and, and Colorado. Yeah. And over time, they, they, they put some uh, pumping permit and other policies. So, so now we, we see some restoration, yeah. uh, restoration of the flow in the Republic River Basin to Kansas. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of a good story.
the, the next question is also kind of a higher level uh, conceptual. So in your opinion, what, what do you think is the value of the modeling in river basin plan? How we actually use it? Right? So it's like, what's the value for it? I, I teach CE434, mm -hmm. uh, environmental and water resource systems. Mm -hmm. So when I start to talk about the model, yeah. I always quote Peter Locke's statement. Mm -hmm. Model is communication tool. Uh -huh. Or it's just a communication yeah, tool, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think that's still really true. That's yeah. still, it provides us like kind of media, kind of platform yeah, yeah. For, for modelers and users, for people from different areas, for researchers and, and the practitioners hmm. to dialogue, mm -hmm. to explore something. Uh, and, and then we could we could find out some meaningful solutions yeah. to solve yeah. the real world problem. Yeah, I, I can share my the, the story of my involvement in environmental sustainability of biofuel, bioenergy development. Mm -hmm. You know that I uh, my research has been sponsored a lot for the biofuel development. You know, the biofuel de biofuel market or biofuel the feature of biofuel really depends on multiple stakeholders: biomass producers, biorefinery industry, rural communities, government and NGOs. Yep. So our hypothesis is that a kind of appropriate coordination and interactions among those stakeholders is the key for the emergence of the market. We call that as a stakeholder synergy. Uh, so how could we test this hypothesis? So we developed an a, a agent-based model. <laughs> we developed an agent-based model and we define all different kinds of stakeholders as agents. And, uh, and then we, of course, we focus a lot on, on the interactions between different types of agents. So by the way, this is one of the few pro a ABM projects in my group, which is kind of based on the data <laughs> because, because we, we spend a lot of time on the deep survey with producers and that helps us a lot and we also did some uh, fox group fox group studies with with stakeholders from different sectors so the idea is that we we we, we define this as a commune bioenergy community communication tool so in one of the one of the workshops a stakeholder a local stakeholder told us a small scale facilities okay we, we should not talk we should not Think about large scale refinery facility at this moment. It's not realistic. Mm -hmm. But but he said in order to train the in order to kind of train the market, unite the market, we should start from some small scale refinery facilities and use that to encourage biomass production. That idea was discussed a lot. Yeah. And the industry people they showed some different opinions. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we 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 develop a scenario with our agent-based model. We test, we test the possible path based on this small-scale facility. And we have very positive results. And eventually we we bring the we, we brought out those we brought those people together and almost everyone is convinced yeah. and this is a good idea. So so that's what I, I use this as an example to say how a community communication tool. Yeah. is important for us. That may not be truly new in our water resource planning and management area because back to many years ago, people already was led by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Yeah. They, they tried yeah. to do this participation approach, the user's yeah. participation approach. Yeah. Uh, but we could certainly do much better today because of the technology, right? Yeah. Because yeah. now we could do online meetings, including not many, many people. And yeah. it's easy to communicate with people. We have better data. And of course, we have new models like ABM. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's really, I, I, I hope, and it doesn't mean I, I try to promote ABM, but I just want to say, so how could we make our models better serve the effective communication mm -hmm. among different groups of people? Yeah, and to our audience, reference of the, the program, as Kai mentioned uh, in USAC, that's called uh, Share Vision Planning. Oh, or share which plan? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. exactly. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, and also, you, you yeah, probably yeah. have that in your thesis. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know it's a participation approach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah. And share they, I think they started from, I think, nineteen ninety two or some very, very early. Um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. in early early nineteen ninety.
Then the last question is uh, forward looking. So then, then what do you, what's your envision about like model and their roles in the, in the decision making project in the next maybe 10, 20 years? I, I, I want to emphasize the motivations of outstanding problems yeah. uh, because of the climate change, social economic mm -hmm. development, yeah. uh, based on development, especially in developing countries. So in many countries, they are putting more uh, regulate, more reservoirs. There are new land use development. So that could affect the water availability that will and will make the water allocation more complex. Right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we are we are facing this kind of challenge, especially for the transboundary river basins, yeah. uh, because we have to deal with the relationship between countries. And also we, we will have a lot of new institutional development, like new organizations, new policies, right? Uh, so in the U.S., although we don't have the centralized authority for like Mississippi Rural Basin, yeah. but over the past decade, there has been a lot of a lot more institutional development. So how could how could our model play a role? I mean, provide support, provide in, inputs. Uh, and uh, that's really, that's a, that's an opportunity for us. And now everybody knows we, we try to embarrass uh, the SDG, Sustainable mm, Development no, Goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how could we download, how could, I mean, at the river basin level, we, yeah. we may not, we could not directly use these 17 SDGs, yeah, yeah. right? We have to some way down, downscale yeah. the SDGs to the, to the basin level. And then we could develop local indicators, local policies. That's a very good challenge for, for us, especially for young researchers. So, and also, of course, now with, with better technology, more data, we could do better water use monitoring. We were always in the U.S., we have a good data availability, but think about that. What kind of water use data do we have in this yeah. country? Right? No, 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 <laughs> we still have this every five year county oh, yeah. level data. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. we but, but but that's not very much useful, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Because, uh, you know, in many cases we have to deal with the sub-county or yeah. city level yeah. water availability and, and, and water use. Regarding the modeling, I, I still, I, I might just want to emphasize again, because that could be an opportunity in, 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 for us in the next uh, 10 or 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. So we know it's difficult to to meme, to to simulate the brain, right? The brain yeah, of him, yeah, yeah. like a like a, a perfect mental model, realistic mental model. That's that's not that's not realistic. But I mean, directly including users, yeah. following this shared vision modeling approach, yeah, yeah. could be promising. Yeah, I, I think that I hope this will become a direction. And then of course they like like the data support I already mentioned and the better models, better softwares, those things could always bring up opportunities for, for next for the near future. The next question is about how is the uh, stakeholder participation affect the model development process and also the decision making process in general in your your past experiences, but, but I think you already touched. Is is there anything more detail you want to share with uh, with us? It's it's really not too much to talk more about this. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. uh, I know people try to emphasize this aspect. We really want to throw throw the participation, throw the interactions with stakeholders. We hope our models are more realistic, are useful, and eventually used. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah, a, that's yeah. really our purpose. But in terms of like, how could we make use this participation for our modern work, yeah. and eventually for the stakeholders benefit? Yeah. I I I think maybe there were there were there were there were some directions to go. So why is say like how could we you know dealing for basin basin work, basin planning and management, we have to deal with multiple stakeholders, yeah. right? How could we deal, how do we deal with the trade-offs and the synergies among them? Uh, I mean, this is an old, but still new <laughs> issue for, for us. And the other thing I, I already mentioned that, how could we develop a better interface, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah. So the interface to support the participation, mm. uh, to make the particip participation sustainable. Yeah. And this online online interfaces, online programs could be uh, were helpful. And the third point I, I really want to emphasize is, is that I already said that is how could we develop trust with stakeholders? Uh, first of all, they have a basic trust about our model. And then yeah. they will start to 
learn, right? <laughs> they start to, to use our tool, they start to learn something new. A practical vision is that, can we show them through our model? Can we show them what happened in the past? You know, in the hydrology community, they call that as a hand cast rather than forecast. Yeah. Can you do hand cast and show me how they, fo they forecast at that time or fact the decision making? So, you know, we talked about the positive optimization, right? Yeah. <laughs> you do optimization. Now, think about all kinds of optimi the, the constraints. Can you show your, can you show, can you show that your your the optimal solution are actually close to the real world? Yeah, 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 <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Given all constraints are included, right? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to emphasize we maybe that's a way mimic what happened in the past. Yeah. This is a way for us to to make them have a little more trust on the yeah. model. Yeah. But yeah. then of course we want to change them, right? Then yeah. we, we could the model could provide different kinds of prompts for them to explore for them to learn, and that's our purpose. If a user could use our model to learn something, use the learning to support their uh, actual decision. Yeah, I think that's the concept, like you, if you want somebody to trust your model, you need to demonstrate the credibility on the model. Exactly, first, exactly. Right? there are many ways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. otherwise, why why should I trust you if you cannot even do that? Like. It doesn't. It doesn't real. It doesn't work in the in the real world, right? So so yeah, yeah. That's very very solid uh, point. The, the next question. I think we also touched this a little bit. So in the future, what what kind of technical or process space related model enhancement that you think we can incorporate in the model de development process to improve our our uh, basing planning? So as I emphasize, as I talked in the very beginning, I try to incorporate a little more hydrology into my work. Mm -hmm. And also I want my uh, the decision framework to be realistic. So I I, I still, I, I think this coupled human nature system mechanism or, or concept fo follows this direction. But 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 again, I, I believe no matter what kind of ways we used to incorporate human dimension, we 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 should try, yeah. right? We should couple that with our physically based model to have more realistic simula simulation or optimization of the real world basins or other water resource systems. Actually, we did some work in, in a river basin in China. It's called the He River Basin in China. Just, just recently, uh, we published a paper describing how aging based model was endogeneously incorporated into a hydrological simulation model. Mm -hmm. It's not just the coupling between the two components. Mm -hmm. They are endogeneously yeah. included. So, yeah. so all the direct all the interactions or dynamics are included within the model, within a mm -hmm. single model. So the project was was led by uh, Professor Trin Miao Den. I mentioned that because I to my knowledge, I, I think that's that's probably the first model like we we could really put things together. So how could we enhance the human dimension? So hydrologists are talking about that. We we have been addressing that all the time, right? Yeah. But how could we do better? Yeah. <laughs> how could we do better? How could we make our, our modeling products used by them, yeah. uh, be helpful for them? That, that's, we, we still have a lot of work to do. And the other things I, I, I mentioned that is uh, the forecast informed planning. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's also, that, that could be some progress, but additional enhancements will be, will be helpful. So our next question and the last one is more linked to the educational aspects. Based on your experiences and the project, all the projects that you, uh, you have been uh, involved with, can you give people some advice uh, to to someone who's actually in our field in water resource planning who's just starting river basin planning or modeling? What kind of advice you will give it to? You might remember, Ethan. You might remember a paper back to early nineteen nineties. There was a statement in that paper that said water resources systems is kind of dying. But fortunately, over the past decades, right, yeah. our era is growing. The assistance committee is growing. We, we have more and more publications, yeah. and uh, you're still the, one of the leaders of the AGO Water for Society Committee, yeah. right? Yeah. So we are all using the so-called assistance approach. But I, I really want to emphasize, or want, want to encourage the new researchers, uh, young researchers, 
to learn a, a bit more about the so-called complex system, the coupled human nature systems, because those concepts are based on some theories or methods for complex systems as a physical, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's actually, it's a, it's a physics area. So, so that area addresses the, the so-called co-evolution. So now we are talking about how our decisions co-evolve with the natural processes, right? There's some feedbacks, because that we, we, we're all great. That's important for us to simulate tipping point, important for us to develop more re responsive policies. So I, I, I hope I hope maybe I'll, I'll always encourage my students to take uh, the, the course on complex assistance. But fortunately, I, I think that was taught by a professor in physics, but, but he, the professor left, our professor retired. Now we, we at our campus, mm. we don't have that course anymore. <laughs> so, so that's one. And the other one is that we are we are uh, developing a lot of modeling algorithms, especially for large scale optimizations. Today, we we probably we, we should pay attention on how data techniques, how a large amount of data could help us to develop new relationships, especially the hidden relationships, yeah, which yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. involve yeah. human behavior side, yeah. the hidden variables, and then could be used to, to improve our model, our physically based model. Yeah. That follows some kind of direction as, as a physically based yeah. machine learning uh, approach. Yeah. So I probably don't need to, to say too much because you already say at the EWRI conference in Atlanta this year, you say how many talks are, <laughs> are about yeah. data. So but I, I really think the, the, the data could help us to have more realistic representation of the human dimension. Yeah. But last thing I, I want to I want to emphasize is, is beyond academics. Okay. Yeah. Really, if you if you want your work to be more influential, if, if you want your your model to be applied and more applied yeah. and generate some impacts. So as a researcher, we we need to learn some interperson communication <laughs> skills. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. How could you yeah. better communicate yeah. with your yeah. clients, with the funding uh, providers, yeah. Uh, yeah. with the public, right? Also yeah. with the yeah. public. So that could really improve the impact of your world beyond the impact factor, right? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, actually, we, we try to incorporate those things in our curriculum yeah. at the University yeah. of Illinois uh, to provide some necessary communication scale yeah. education for, for our next generation of engineers. The last point is definitely like, because I think business school, that's the entire thing. They, they train their student to present something in a very creative way. So so they can do business, right? But in engineering, we never, we just tell our students, yeah, just just do your model and make it make it realistic, make it make it solid. But we never tell them how do you communicate your result or how you, how you present your result with the real world people, which is our layer. We definitely need to um, in, enhance that aspect in the engineering school. I think that's, that's definitely a great suggestion. The last question for our side, is, do you have any advice to somebody who's not in our field, or um, but maybe they are interested in collaborations, or maybe they want to learn more about water systems? Do you have any suggestion or the advice to them? Yeah, certainly based on planning and management is not just a business for our engineers. They are for uh, not, not, not only for civil engineers. They are the, the, the business for engineers in many, many areas. I'm uh, talking to my colleague at the University of Illinois. It looks like in, in future years, in electronic engineers might take some of our job, right? Oh. By more efficient sensors. Yeah, right? yeah. And we particularly emphasize the social aspect. That's not new, right? We, yeah. we, we for many years, we have tried to collaborate with, with uh, social scientists and then we, we could work on some realistic aspects of the basin planning and management. But based on my own experience, uh, I mean, that's not easy, to be honest. Unless someday our education is fundamentally changed. I think this gap between different disciplines, we should not ignore that. So although I, I have been working with with many economists uh, and, and even some social scientists, I also get embarrassed in mm. many cases. So it looks like, hey, don't talk to me. You don't understand this. 
<laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> so, so I, I think this, uh, this kind of, anyway, for our people who are interested in based in planning and management, yeah. we really need some open mind yeah. to yeah. appreciate others' work, to understand others' work. And of course, we don't want to replace others' work. Yeah, we don't yeah, want yeah. to say, hey, actually, yeah. I'm doing this. You're yeah, not doing yeah. Understand to each other. That's very important. And, mm -hmm. and then, of course, if we have good attitude, so hopefully we could develop some common vocabularies and then we could communicate. Yeah. Uh, if we don't have some common vocabularies, yeah. it's so difficult yeah. to communicate. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm, all this years, I'm still teaching the environmental and water resource systems. Mm -hmm. Now I included a quite significant economic part. Mm -hmm. so, so at the end, at the end of the course, I just hope all students in the class, some of them, they, they taught the economic class, some of them did not have any background in economics. But I hope at the end of the class, they could use like marginal value, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. What is the marginal value? Yeah. And, and what is the balance, balance of that for water resources, yeah. for engineering development? Yeah. I hope they could do that. Yeah. Uh, because... Because then it will be easier for them to communicate with the economists, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I hope the, the world is moving to that direction with a better environment for people to from different areas to communicate mm -hmm. and, and then to develop some young solution. I think the common experiences that people who are doing in the in the disciplinary work is that sometimes you say something. And that thing means different thing in different field. And then so they misunderstood. So you actually, you, you need to spend a, more time to even define um, something like in my experience, it's like, well, I say watershed, but that means something for I guess, e uh, ecologists or some, some other people. So then yeah. the, the communication you know, in, in the di 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 uh, discipline world is definitely something that we, 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 we can uh, keep in improving. But, but lastly, I, I, I mean, I like to add a comment. This is a very yeah. personal comment. Yeah. Yeah. In this country, I, I really hope the the lawmakers, the policy makers, yeah. especially at the federal level, could hear more voices from the engineering science community about river basin management in this country, because there is no major change, right, for the large basins crossing yeah. multiple states in this yeah. time. There's some way managed by USACE. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we probably need we probably need some better institution right, for the sustainable development of large basins in this country. One urgent issue right now is in Colorado River, right? Everybody is there's no there's no there's no one anymore. So then, how the federal government is doing, and what is what, what is the state governments? Because if they listen to you know, I I I definitely think some. I think Jalen also published a paper a couple of years ago. They they already talk about this. They, yeah. When they set out a treaty, the water is not enough. So you cannot just follow that treaty and say that we follow the law. Some yeah. updates needed, but nobody is really doing. Yeah, yeah like like the, uh, the, the largest basin, Mississippi River Basin, this, yeah. this probably there is a, a more outstanding issue. Yeah. So, you know, in the, in the, in the Gulf area, in yeah. the oh, yeah, yeah. area, Right, yeah. we have land loss. We have yeah. very significant yeah. land loss because of the mass sediment transfer yeah, 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 yeah. in the oasis. Yeah. But in the upstream, we are doing best management practices yeah, to, yeah. to avoid yeah. soil erosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, yeah. And, uh, on the river, we have those small dams to block yeah. to some way they, they block the sediment yeah. for yeah. and, and, and 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 develop storage for navigation. Yeah. So all those things looks like they are it looks like they are they are in conflict. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Coordinate yeah. them at the basin level. Yeah. So that's not I, I mean, of course, scientists we could find we could provide some evidence about things, but eventually we would need the decision makers to yeah. Yeah. set up a more realistic institution for yeah. real world management. Yeah, so yeah, that's beyond the research. Thank you very much. I, I'm really excited in talking to you about, about all those important questions. I want to thank anyone, any audience who might watch this this uh, video. I welcome them to, to send me comments yeah, yeah. and we could we could have uh, more discussions about about those uh, thoughts. Thank Professor Kai again for, for your time and your wonderful uh, suggestion and comment that you share with us. Also, I want to thank uh, all the audience who is watching this episode. Again, I'm uh, Ethan Yang and hope to see you in the next RBPPO interview video.
See you, everyone.